I'm often misconstrued as advocating that we pass laws against religious belief, that somehow we, we create some mechanism whereby we really put, you turn down the screws on religious people. Uh, I'm not advocating that at all. I'm really advocating just new rules of conversation. I mean, ask yourself, what do we do with the astrologers? You know, I mean, how, how have we managed to keep astrologers off the Supreme Court or off our medical boards or... But not out of the White House. Yeah, well, the, <laughs> it's, there's always marriage, the peril of marriage, perhaps. Um, but by and large, astrologers are not acquiring vast responsibility in our society. And we're not continually ambushed by the, the neurosurgeon who doesn't want to perform surgery that day because Saturn is in retrograde or whatever. I mean, this is not happening. Uh, it's not happening because when someone talks with too much conviction about the effect of, of the planets on, on human affairs, uh, we begin to stop listening to them. We stop taking them seriously. They don't get promoted. There no, there's no laws involved. And I just think that that should happen when, when people begin uh, to express their certainty that Jesus is coming back in their lifetime, etc., etc. Yeah. The goal is to spread uh, secular thinking and scientific knowledge in society and to do that in a very multidisciplinary way. I mean, to do it in, in terms of organizing conferences and, and, and uh, funding scientific research, but also to create uh, documentaries and, and uh, media events. Um, and we have a very diverse board from, from scientists like Steven Weinberg to entertainers like, like Bill Maher and, and uh, writers like Ian McEwan and Salman Rushdie. I mean, my, my image is, this is a problem of, of transforming the way people think about uh, the human project and, and uh, transforming the, the kind of expectations we have of our neighbors uh, uh, for making sense in public discourse. And so I, I see a role for um, business and, and uh, entertainment and also, you know, hard, you know, laboratory scholarship to come at this from all angles because we, we all have to start talking the talk uh, from all sides very quickly here, it seems to me. I will speak about Christianity specifically just to, to for, for ease. Christianity is based on the notion that the gospel account of the miracles of Jesus is true. This is what you have to reject to reject Christianity. You don't have to prove the universe to be absent of God. Uh, you don't have to, in the same way that you don't have to go find that Poseidon or Zeus or any of the thousands of other dead gods are absent from the universe. With Christianity, it is a textual claim about the veracity of the Bible. Consider what this amounts to. Bible scholars agree that the first, the first Gospels were written decades after the life of Jesus. Decades. And of course, we don't have the, the original manuscripts. We have copies of copies of copies of ancient Greek manuscripts, which have thousands, literally thousands of discrepancies between them, uh, many of which show signs of later interpolation, which is to say that people added passages that, that then became part of the canon. Uh, there are whole books of the canon, like the Book of Revelation, which for hundreds of years were not included because they were deemed false gospel. There are other, other whole books, like the Shepherd of Hermas, which you probably haven't heard of, but for centuries it was considered part of the canon and then was later jettisoned as false gospel. Generations of Christians lived and died being guided by gospel that is now deemed both incomplete and, mis and, and mistaken. Think about that. So this process, this all too human process of cobbling together the, the supposed authoritative word of God is a very precarious basis to assert the claims of Christianity. But the truth is, even if we had multiple contemporaneous claims uh, of the miracles of Jesus, this would not be good enough. Because miracle stories abound even in the 21st century. The devotees of, of the South Indian guru Satya Sai Baba ascribe all of the miracles of Jesus to him. He reads minds, he foretells the future, he, heal, he raises the dead, he was born of a virgin. Okay, Satya Sai Baba is, is not a fringe figure. You might not have heard of him, but he, they had a birthday party for him a few years ago, and a million people showed up. There are vast numbers of people who think he's a living God. Okay, so Christianity is predicated on the claim that miracle stories, exactly of the kind that today surround a person like Satya Sai Baba, become especially credible when you place them in the pre-scientific 
religious context of the first century Roman Empire, decades after their supposed occurrence, as attested to by copies of copies of copies of ancient Greek and largely discrepant manuscripts. We have Sakti Sai Baba's mir miracle stories attested to by thousands upon thousands of living eyewitnesses, and they don't even merit an hour on cable television. And yet you put a few miracle stories in an ancient book, and half the people on the earth think it a legitimate project to organize their lives around them. Does anyone else see a problem with that? Our ability to cause ourselves harm is now spreading with 21st century efficiency. And yet we are still, to a remarkable degree, drawing our vision of how to live in this world from ancient literature. Th this marriage of, of modern technology, destructive technology, and Iron Age philosophy is a bad one for reasons that I think nobody should have to specify, much less argue for. And yet arguing for them has, has taken up most of my time since September 11th, 2001. That day that, that 19 pious men showed our pious nation just how socially beneficial religious certainty can be. These are religion is everywhere, and it's, it's something that, um, it's, it does immense unnecessary harm at its worst, and at its best, it gives people bad reasons to be good where good reasons are actually available. This is the problem. Whenever you can see someone doing really good things in the name of faith, you can find better reasons to do those things. And that's, that's so, so you, when people go to Africa, you know, there, there, there's no question that people of faith do uh, immensely compassionate things uh, much of the time. And so, so people will go to, you know, missionaries will go to Africa and put themselves in harm's way and try to, try to um, uh, deliver aid to, to people on the verge of famine. And there's, 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 it's an intrinsically good thing to do, but rather often you see the, the co compassion of the, the whole enterprise eroded by this other agenda, which is to spread the gospel in, in this case. And so you have people preaching the importance of believing in Jesus in areas where conflict between Christians and Muslims has literally killed millions of people. Uh, and in, in the most diabolical instances, with, withholding aid from people who, have, until they have somehow confessed an allegiance to, to the, the creed you're, you're spreading, uh, it would be so much better to actually just care about the suffering of other human beings and want to alleviate it. And that's actually possible to do. You have secular people, you have people like, you know, the people who work with Doctors Without Borders, for instance, who, who for reasons that have nothing to do with the next life, try to make this life uh, at least tolerable for the, the least advantaged people on Earth. So, I, so the problem with religion is that even in its, even as in its best instance, it gives you a version of, of ethical truth that could be improved by stripping out the, the dogmatism and um, the, the, the unjustified claims to uh, knowledge. What liberals have, con where liberals have grown confused on this topic is they think there's some tension between free speech and freedom of religion, wh whereas there's not. There's, if, if your free exercise of your religion requires that I follow its precepts, that's not freedom of religion. That is theocracy. Mm. Right, so, so, and there's nothing I could say on this stage tonight that infringes upon anyone's freedom of religion. There's nothing. People have the political freedom to practice whatever faith they want in this country, and we all, as just sane participants in a civil society, have to recognize that all of these religious ideas have to be, be on the table to be criticized, mocked, satirized, uh, and that's, that's, that has to be the, the, the line between free speech and its erosion. That, for me, is, is, is the most crucial line to be very clear about. We are misled, especially in the secular community, by the term religion. Religion is a word like sports. There are sports that are incredibly dangerous, that are synonymous with violence, like a sport like Thai boxing, or mixed martial arts, or football. And there are sports that, that by definition, entail no danger whatsoever. Badminton, 
lawn bowling. I mean, these, these, these two ends of the continuum have almost nothing in common except for breathing. And yet we, we have this one word, sports. Now, religion is a suitcase term like this. And so Bob, I think, has, has it's not by accident that, he is, that he's kind of focused on Islam in, in uh, his remarks. And it's not by accident that we have, uh, that certainly I have tended to focus on Islam. We are, we are not doing ourselves a service pretending that all religions are the same. I mean, beliefs matter, specific beliefs matter. And Bob is trying to uncouple religious belief from what people actually do in the world, like blow themselves up in crowds of, of innocent strangers. But the people who have done this work, like, like Roger Robert Pape or Scott Atran or any of the other uh, academics who are fundamentally skeptical of the link between Islam and suicide bombing are people who, when I talk to them, uh, clearly express an inability to digest the fact that people actually believe what they say they believe. There are people who are certain of paradise. It's the certainty about paradise. It's the certainty that the doctrine of martyrdom is true that is what's so terrifying about Islam. Now, and I ask you, wh where are all of the Palestinian Christian suicide bombers? I think there, I think there probably has been one. Okay, but, but by and large, I mean, there are Palestinian Christians. They are Palestinian. They live in the occupied territories. They are not reliably blowing themselves up. Okay, so this is a distinction, and, and perhaps Bob and I are, will want to get into that. The entire doctrine is predicated on the idea that the, the gospel account of the miracles of Jesus is true. This is, this is why people believe Jesus was the Son of God, divine, etc. This textual claim, this te textual claim is problematic because everyone acknowledges that the gospels followed Jesus' ministry by decades, and there, there's no extra biblical account of his miracles. But, but the, the truth is quite a bit worse than that. The truth is, even if we had multiple contemporaneous eyewitness accounts of the miracles of Jesus, this still would not provide sufficient basis to believe that these events actually occurred. But it remains a fact that yogis and mystics uh, are said to be walking on water and raising the dead and flying without the aid of technology, uh, materializing objects, reading minds, foretelling the future. R right now, in fact, all of these powers have been ascribed to Satya Sai Baba, the, the South Indian guru, by an uncountable number of eyewitnesses. Now, he even claims to have been born of a virgin, which is not all that uncommon a claim in, his, in the history of religion. Or in history generally, Genghis Khan supposedly was born of a virgin, as was, was Alexander. Apparently, parthenogenesis doesn't guarantee that you're going to turn the other cheek. Uh, <laughs> But Satya Sai Baba is not a fringe figure. He's not the David Koresh of Hinduism. His followers threw a birthday party for him recently, and a million people showed up. So there, there are vast numbers of people who believe he is a living god. You can even watch his miracles on YouTube. Prepare to be underwhelmed. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's true that he has an afro of sufficient diameter as to suggest a total detachment from the opinions of his fellow human beings. but. I'm not sure this is reason enough to worship him. Uh, in any case, so consider, as though for the first time, the foundational claim of Christianity. The claim is this, that miracle stories of a sort that today surround a person like Satya Sai Baba become especially compelling when you set them in the pre-scientific religious context of the first century Roman Empire decades after their supposed occurrence. We have Satya Sai Baba's miracle stories attested to by thousands upon thousands of living eyewitnesses, and they don't even merit an hour on the Discovery Channel. But you place a few miracle stories in some ancient books, and half the people on this earth think it a legitimate project to organize their lives around them. Does anyone else see a problem with that? People want to be happier. People want to be uh, less burdened by unnecessary psychological suffering. How can we bring that about? 
is, is delusion the only remedy? Uh, it's a, de delusion has its place. I mean, delusion actually works for some people some of the time, but it actually, it's not, it is a fragile remedy. You know, reality intrudes, and then your delusions are, are no longer helping you. And so it seems to me that, that we're all continually going to be in a better position to figure out how to be happy together and to, figure, and, and to see that our collaboration with one another is not zero sum. I mean, it's not like my happiness is predicated on your losing happiness. Um, for the most part, as human beings, our happiness is predicated on, on us recognizing more and more of the time that we have a common project. Um, and uh, it seems to me that one of the challenges of science is to figure out how to, uh, to focus us on, the, on that common project with the least amount of friction with the least amount of, of unnecessary, divisive, sectarian um, uh, loss of resources, essentially. And when you look at the difference between science and religion in the way they break down or fail to break down uh, boundaries between people, uh, I mean, science is, is the greatest uh, uh, force for the removal of conversational barriers we have ever hit upon. I mean, there is no such thing as American science versus Japanese science. There's no such thing as Jewish science versus Hindu science. I mean, there, there is, there is, there's just science. Um, and uh, there ha at some level, that, that has to be true of ideas generally. It has to be true of the ideas that, that uh, cash out our, our moral intuitions and um, uh, our deepest goals in life. Well, I didn't learn much because one salient mistake was to talk about MDMA in an interview. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I had an interview with the um, the LA Times, and it was on track to be a you know your standard interview. And and the mention of MDMA became uh, it became the atheist has mo his mind blown on MDMA interview. Uh, so don't do that again. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I'm glad you, glad yes, you avoided you doing can, that yeah, again. You can see. <laughs> if you pay attention, you can see that you, you no more author the next thing you think than the next thing I say. Thoughts simply appear in consciousness. Or what, what, what are you going to think next? What am I going to say next? I could suddenly start talking about why we don't eat owls. Why don't we eat owls? They seem perfectly good. Okay, now, no. but, what, where did that come from? Okay, it, 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 came, it came out of nowhere as far as you're concerned, but the same thing is happening in your own mind at this moment. I mean, you've, you've all made an effort to be here tonight, presumably because you wanted to hear what I had to say about free will, and now you're trying to listen to me, but you also have a voice in your head that says things. Haven't you noticed? <laughs> and it, it, it says things. Uh, it, it, it says things that are completely unconstrained at times by the thing you're trying to focus on. I mean, I, I'm standing up here trying to reason with you, and you you will think he does look a little like Ben Stiller. Thoughts just emerge in consciousness. We are not authoring them. That would require that we think them before we think them. If you, if you can't control your next thought, and you don't know what it's going to be until it arises, where is your freedom of will? Now, some people try to save free will by saying, well, you're, you're more than that. You're more than just your conscious mind. You are, you are the totality of events occurring in your body. So it doesn't matter that you're not conscious of much of your mental process. And it's your, your, the, un, the unconscious neurophysiology of your brain is just as much you as your conscious experience is. But the problem, however, is that this really is a bait and switch. You, you can't honestly take credit for your unconscious mental life. You, you have, you're making millions of decisions right now 
with organs other than your brain, of which you're not conscious of, but you don't feel responsible for these decisions. I mean, are you making red blood cells at this moment? Now, your body is, hopefully, but if it were to stop doing this, you would be the victim of that change. You wouldn't be its author. The, the truth is we feel or presume an authorship over our actions, over a certain, and thoughts, over a certain channel of information in our conscious minds that is illusory. So, so how can we be free as conscious agents if everything that we consciously intend is caused by things we did not intend and of which we are entirely unaware? We can't. It is just merely asserted from the religious point of view that three-day-old human embryos have souls. You have souls in the Petri dish, you have souls in the little girl with diabetes, you can't, you know, the interest of, uh, who can weigh the interests of one soul against another? And you just have to respect the faith proposition that life starts at the moment of conception, whatever that means. Well, let's talk about the details for a second. Perhaps it sounds scary to destroy human embryos. A, a three-day-old human embryo is a collection of 150 cells. They're arranged in a sphere. There is no brain. There's no nervous system. Maybe 150 cells sounds like a lot of cells. There are 100,000 cells in the brain of a fly. Flies have brains, they have neurons, they have neurons very much like our own. If we know anything at all about the relationship between physical complexity and the, and the, and the possibility of having experience, and the possibility of having interests, we know that more suffering is visited upon this earth every time we swat a fly than when we kill a three-day-old human embryo. It's not enough to say they're potential human beings. You know, given given the, the advances in genetic engineering, every cell in the human body with a nucleus is a potential human being given the right manipulation. Every time the, the president scratches his nose, he's engaged in a holocaust of potential human beings. Another invited speaker approached me and said, how could you ever say, from the point of view of science, that forcing women to wear burqas is wrong? And I said, well, because the moment you admit right and wrong has something to do with, with human well-being, then it's obvious that, that forcing half the population to live in cloth bags and beating them or killing them when they try to get out is, is not a, a good way of maximizing it. And she said, well, well, that's just your opinion. And I said, okay, well, let's make it easier. Let's say we found a culture that was removing the eyeballs of children, every third child, say. We're, would you, would you then agree that we'd found a culture that was not perfectly maximizing human well-being? And she said, well, it would depend on why they were doing it. Uh, and uh, so af after my eyebrows returned from the back of my head, uh, I said, okay, let's say they're doing it for religious reasons. Let's say they have a scripture which says every third should walk in darkness or some such nonsense. And she said, well, then you could never say that they were wrong. Now, you should know that I was speaking to a woman who was uh, quite a uh, sophisticated student of philosophy and science. In fact, she, she has since been appointed to the President's Council on Bioethics in the United States. She's one of 13 people advising President Obama on all of the ethical implications of, of medicine uh, and progress in, in related science and technology. And she had just delivered a perfectly lucid lecture on the moral implications of advances in neuroscience. And she was especially concerned that we might be subjecting captured terrorists to fMRI-based lie detection technology. And she thought, she, she thought this would be a, a, a truly unconscionable violation of their, their cognitive liberty. Uh, so on the one hand, her, her moral scruples were really finely calibrated to, to recoil from the slightest perceived misstep in our war on terror, and yet she was totally detached from the very real suffering of millions of women in Afghanistan at this moment. So I view this double standard as a problem. And strangely, this is the erosion of basic common sense and moral goodness that religious people tend to be worried about. 
Uh, now, I, I hope it's obvious to all of you and will be even more obvious at the end of this hour that, that religion isn't the answer to this problem. It's, it matters, however, that scripture, and this is not just the Quran, this is, also, this is most scripture, uh, it matters that these texts are, ethically speaking, not the wisest books we have. It, and it matters that most human beings think they were dictated by the creator of the universe. It, it, you could improve the Quran and you could improve the Bible in five minutes to the benefit of everybody. And yet we can't rewrite these pages, so we're, we're stuck with, with figuring out how to convince billions of people to interpret them in the most benign way. But if, if, if every page of the Quran had on the bottom of it a little footnote saying, oh, by the way, you know, don't kill anyone for their beliefs, you know, don't, you know, and, and homosexuals just fine, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> and women are the equals of men, despite what I seem to have said in these other surahs, women are every bit the equals of men. Um, we would live in a better world. Muslims would live in a better world. And it's hard, it, because the Quran doesn't say anything like that, and because the Quran gives you a very plausible rationale for viewing women as the property of men, more than truly their equals. Uh, Muslims are left trying to, to, to do some very acrobatic theology on that point, and they have to do that acrobatic th theology, and Majid I'm, uh, is convinced that they have the tools to do that, and I think you're convinced that they have the tools to do that, but it would be a hell of a lot easier if somebody with 21st century values could just write a, a really good page in the Quran and slip <laughs> it in there. So on this point. Well, to take the other side of that, though, it, it, theologians are not lazy. They're doing some very hard work. <laughs> and that's, that's, you know, it's, yeah. they're, spent, they're burning a lot of fuel trying to make sense of their doctrines. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. Well, I think this is the political and ethical problem of our time. I, I mean, in the, the largest, most generic sense, I think the, the contest between good ideas and bad ideas and the contest between good methodologies at, at arriving at, at ideas and bad ones, I think that is the, uh, the most important distinction to get right, both personally and, and, and uh, at the level of uh, societies. And um, religion at this moment has a monopoly on uh, being able to prom promulgate bad ideas without the usual collisions with clear thinking people in the world. There's, there's a taboo against criticizing bad thinking, um, illogical thinking, false claims to evidence, false claims to knowledge. And I think this has a just a, a destabilizing effect on human cooperation in general, because it, it, all we have is, is a choice between conversation and violence when things really matter. And when you're telling me that there are certain things you know to be true, but you're, you, 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 the way you know them is not based on any kind of publicly uh, available mode of evidence or reasoning, uh, and these things are not only non-negotiable, they're the most important principles in your life, this is intrinsically divisive, and this, this worries me across the board with all religion, but with certain religions, it, their commitments don't matter all that much. You know, the fact that Jains won't kill animals and are, are rather uh, dogmatic vegetarians, that's not a problem for anyone. And um, we're not going to see Jain terrorists insofar as they, they are, and, and this, is, this is why fundamentalism is a, is a is a term of art and, and, and a red herring. If the fundamentalism is not a problem if the fundamentals of your religion are totally benign. The, the crazier you get as a Jain, the less anyone has to worry about you. Uh, and that's, that is uh, rather obviously not true of Islam as a religion, uh, nor is it true of, of many other religions. <clears throat> now you'll have to forgive my cold. I've got uh, more cough medicine on board than is uh, <clears throat> advised, and um, so if I do anything very strange over the course of the next hour, like convert to Christianity, you'll know what happened. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, 
As many of you know, I, I spend a fair amount of time arguing that there's a conflict between religion and science. And the, the conflict is deep and unavoidable and worth taking seriously. And I think science must simply win the argument in the end without any apologies. But the truth is that science has far more inflammatory things to say about religion than we tend to admit. And it's, it's always struck me as very odd that the, the point of conflict between science and religion for nearly a century, actually over a century now, has been the subject of evolution. Well, why does anyone care about evolution? I mean, it, yes, it, it renders the account of human origins in Genesis false, and therefore, by association, casts the, the rest of scripture into some doubt. But nothing about our day-to-day -day lives depends upon our not acknowledging that we share a common ancestor with chimpanzees. Now, I can, I can sort of understand why religious people are uncomfortable with the fact that our ancestors mated with the ancestors of chimps, and not just once, for, for a million years. It, it, just, <clears throat> it took us a million years to get those chimps out of our system, apparently. <clears throat> I think we also have to admit that certain grievances really are just born of religion. They're, they really are just theological. Mm -hmm. And if you, get, if you push back hard enough on the theology, discredit the theology, that is what you need to do to contain the, the, the risk born of these uh, grievances. And so drawing cartoons about the Prophet Muhammad, right? Mm -hmm. now, if I took out a piece of paper now and drew a cartoon, a stick figure, and said, this is Muhammad, it's not implausible to worry that the rest of my life will just be this deranged attempt not